In this video, you will learn how to create projectile attacks that you can use to damage distant enemies or other entities in your game, such as barrels or signs. We'll cover how to spawn in your projectile, various ways that you can handle its velocity, as well as how to handle its collision. Howdy, and welcome to Game Endeavor, where you can learn practical dev skills from an experienced developer. If you want to allow your player to attack enemies from a safe distance, then you will need to implement a ranged attack system in your game. There are countless ways to handle projectiles, but if you don't plan it properly, then later on you may find yourself restricted by your own code. For this tutorial, we're going to be taking a modular approach that will give us a lot of flexibility to expand upon in the future. Let's go ahead and get started. The first thing we're going to do is go ahead and create our projectile scene. We'll instantiate this scene every time we want to attack with a projectile. I have already prepared a scene with a kinematic body 2D as the root a sprite, and a collision shape that will be used to detect when the projectiles collide with an obstacle. I'm using a kinematic body 2D for reasons that I'll get into later, but if you want to be more efficient with your projectiles then you can use an area 2D as an alternative. The root has a script which we'll step into to write the code for our projectile. We'll go ahead and create a variable named velocity which we'll set as a vector 2.0. This will determine the distance per second that the projectile will move. We're also going to need a velocity to set this to when we launch our projectile. So I'll go ahead and create a constant named throw velocity. And since this particular projectile will be thrown up into the air, I'll set it to a vector 2 that is up and to the right. If you want to throw at a specific angle like in a top down game, then you can just use a float constant instead, which you will later multiply by the normal of the direction that the projectile will launch in. In the next tutorial, I will show you how you can aim this velocity so that it will hit a specific position while gravity is being applied. This can be useful for allowing the player to aim their shots or giving enemies better aim when attacking the player. Now we need to put our velocity variable to use, which we're going to do inside of the physics process method. I am storing my gravity variable inside of an auto-loaded script named globals, so that I can call it anywhere within my game. Which I'll do now by multiplying globals.gravity by delta and adding it to the y value of my velocity. Applying gravity is optional and your projectile will have a completely different feel without it. Now we need to apply the velocity to our projectile. I'll be using move and collide for this because it returns collision data which I can put to good use. Unlike move and slide however, move and collide does not apply the delta to our velocity automatically. So make sure that you do this when you pass it to move and collide. We're going to store the return value in a variable named collision. With this collision data, we can now know whether or not we hit something. We check this by seeing if collision is not null. How you handle your collision will be completely dependent on your projectile and your game. You can either destroy the projectile, make it stick into the wall if it's an error, or what I'll be doing, which is causing it to bounce off of the surface. The nifty thing about using this method to check for collisions is that one-way collisions are already handled for us. If you were to use an area, then it would detect the collision despite it being one-way, and you would need to do some fancy logic to determine if you should ignore the collision. We'll handle the bouncing logic inside of a method named onImpact which we'll create. This will require a normalized vector 2 as an argument, which we'll name normal. I want my rock to bounce off of the surface, so I'm going to set the velocity of our projectile equal to our velocity bounced against the normal. Now as it is, this will give the rock infinite bounce, which would be great if you're thinking with portals, but I would like for my projectile to eventually come to a stop. We can do this by lowering the velocity every time it bounces, which I will do by multiplying velocity by 0.5. The higher this value, the more bouncy the object will be. For a little variation, you can also add some randomness to the bounce by adding rand range, negative 0 0.05, 0 0.05. With the basic physics for our projectile implemented, we now want to create the logic for launching it. How you handle this will be dependent on your game. For this tutorial, I will be spawning the rock in the player's hand. Paul Barrow will then lunge forward with the rock. He'll release it, and then follow through returning to the idle position. We want the rock to release partially through the animation rather than immediately, which means that we don't want to apply our physics logic immediately when it's spawned. So we'll create a ready method and in it we'll disable physics process by saying set physics process false. We'll enable this again when we're ready to apply the physics. Now we'll create the method that will apply the throwing logic. This method is named launch and will be called outside of the class by the entity that will be throwing the projectile. We need to know what direction to throw the projectile in, which will be the direction parameter. For me, I just need to know the direction of the x-axis, so it will be a sign value that will determine if the projectile is moving left or right. If you're using the y-axis, such as in a top-down game, then you will need a normalized vector too. 
When we launch this projectile, it is going to start parented to a position node on the character's hand. We need to reparent it so that its position is no longer relative to the character's hand. Otherwise, you will end up walking the dog. To do this, we're going to tell its parent to remove itself by calling get parent dot remove child self. Now we need to re-add the projectile to the scene. The easiest way to do this is to add it to the current scene, which we can get from the scene tree. However, you need to be in the scene tree to properly call the get tree method, which you'll recall we just removed ourselves from. To get around this, we'll get the current scene before we remove ourselves and store it inside of a variable named scene. With that done, we can now tell scene to add ourselves as a child. However, the projectile doesn't get to keep its previous location. It gets reset and will respawn at 0, 0. We'll go ahead and fix this before it can cause any headaches. Luckily, all of the data we want to carry over is stored inside of a transform variable. We can get our global transform and store it inside of a temporary variable before we reparent. And then, after we're back in the scene tree, we can apply our temporary variable to our global transform. If you're launching your projectile immediately after spawning it, then you can skip all of this reparenting process and just set its global position to where you want it to spawn. Now that our rock is independent of our character's arm, we can start applying velocity to it. We can do this by setting velocity equal to throw velocity times vector2 direction 1. The second vector2 is meant to modify the x value of throw velocity so that it moves in the correct direction. If you're using a normalized vector2 for direction, then you would instead multiply the float value mentioned earlier by your normal. And since we're now officially launched, we also want physics to kick back in, so we'll re-enable physics processing again. We can now give this rock to our player. I'm using the cutout character rig that I covered in a previous tutorial. This will make it easy for me to parent a position node to my character's hand where I want the rock to spawn. I will also set the position node to render behind its parent, that being the arm. And temporarily, I am going to instance a rock to the position node so that I can set the rotation of the position node so that the rock is rotated how I want it when released. But I'm going to delete the rock afterwards, otherwise the player will always be holding a rock. Inside of the character rig script, I have added a signal named throw item, which we'll use to tell the player when to release the item. I have pre-made a throwing animation. I want to emit that signal from inside of the animation player which I can do by creating a call method track and inserting a new key on the frame that where I would like to emit the signal. And we can use this key to call the emit signal method, modifying it to accept our signal name as the parameter. I can then go into the player scene, connect the throw item signal to my player. For convenience, I will have it call the method throw held item directly. At the top of my player script, I want to cache the reference to the pack scene of the projectile inside of a constant, which I will name rock projectile ps. I also want to cache the position node that I created earlier, so I'll store it inside of a variable named held item position. Since I'm not throwing the held item immediately after it spawns, I will need to store a reference to it, so I'll create a variable named held item within my class variables. Before we can throw the rock, we first need to have a rock, so I'll create a method named spawn rock. We don't want to spawn a rock if we currently have an item in our hand. So we'll check to make sure that held item is equal to null before continuing. Then we'll instantiate the rock by calling rock projectile ps dot instance and store it inside of our held item variable. And finally, we'll add the held item as a child to our held item position node. We're going to throw the held item now. So inside of the throw a held item method that we created with our character rig, we'll call the launch method of our held item reference, passing to it our facing variable which is just a variable that we have set to what direction our character is facing. And then we'll set held item to null since we no longer need to reference it and would like to know that our furry little paws are empty. Now you're able to launch projectiles. Odds are though you would like for them to detect entities and damage them. I use two custom scenes for this. The first being a hitbox which is just an area 2D set to its own layer but it has a simple script on it with an export variable that will allow you to set the node that will be damaged. It exports a node path that defaults to dot dot which refers to its parent. And then it has an onready variable that uses a node path to get the actual node for it. Just instance this node onto your character, give it a shape, and try not to giggle while caching it into a variable. Then I have a damaged area scene that is also an area 2D, but it masks for the hitbox layer. And inside of the script, it will keep an array of entities not to interact with. And its area enter signal is connected to itself, and once it detects the hitbox, it will make a few checks and then call the damage method on the hitbox entity. You could take this a step further and add a group exception so that you don't get friendly fire. I will go into more detail on the system in a separate tutorial about health, damage, and all that fun stuff. 
add the damaged area to the projectile and then give it a shape. To actually throw the rock, you just need to spawn the projectile and play the throw animation, which will handle launching the item. You may want to do this inside of a state machine, however. I have videos on state machines that will help you get started. There's a playlist in the description and an i-card in the corner. If you would like to learn more practical death skills, then watch this video here. And if you're new, then join the sub club to get notified for future videos.